Welcome to today's webinar, The Modern Telematics Mindset, What It Really Takes to Thrive in the Age of Data and AI, presented by AssetWorks. I'm Nicole Osinski, Executive Editor at Government Fleet, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. I encourage you to ask questions during the webinar at any point, and we will try to address them all. However, if we do not get to yours, don't worry, we will be contacting you by email with a response after the event. Our presenter today is Phil Arsenault, Product Manager for AssetWorks' Integrated GPS Offerings. He serves as a go-to thought leader on all things telematics, including AI dash cams. Now, I'll hand it over to Phil. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many of you were able to, uh, to join us today for this discussion. Um, again, I'm Phil. I've been at, at AssetWorks for the past 10 years. Prior to that, I spent another 15 years in the telematics industry. So back in those days, it was location, speed, direction, and ignition. And that's about all we were capturing as far as telematics go. So it's incredible to see where we've gotten, gotten over time. So today, I just wanna answer a few questions throughout the webinar is, how can telematics meet my individual department and user needs? Uh, more and more, we're seeing that multiple departments, divisions, user groups throughout, different companies and organizations want to take advantage of the telematic data. And how do we present that so it's customized to their individual needs? Next is why do I need AI dash cams in my fleet? I mean, AI dash cams, they've been around for a while now. Um, they're getting a little more traction, but people still aren't sure what the real advantages are. And even then, how do they select the correct one for their needs? Um, after that, we'll talk a little bit about EVs and how having telematics can make adding EVs to your fleet even easier. Um, another section that comes up almost with every fleet that I've worked with over the years, whether it's just GPS, whether it's driver behavior, anything is, how do I get my drivers buy in to me collecting telematic data, right? Nobody wants to be tracked. No one likes the whole big brother idea. So what, what do I have to do to really get beyond that hurdle? And then the last thing is, what do I do with all this data? As I said, back in the day, we were collecting very little data. It was infrequent. It was enough for people to wrap their minds around and manage, but there is so much data being collected today. What do people do with it and how do they use that data? So the first thing I wanna start with is what are telematics? Because a lot of people think, have different ideas on what telematics are. I bet if we asked everybody here with us today, they would all have a little bit of a different idea. There'd be some overlapping thoughts, but there'd be a few different things. So I mean, at the very basis, there's location, there's adherence to safety procedures. I mean, there's things like making sure that on a bus, the wheelchair lift is cycled every day at the start of the uh, at the, at the start of their inspection to make sure that it's working before they head out for the day. There's a lot of different driver behaviors that are collected, harsh driving, things like that. Engine diagnostics is getting more and more important these days, especially now that we're starting to add predictive analytics. So based on the feedback we're getting from the engine, when do we think the engine's gonna need servicing or something's going to fail in the future? Um, utilization, am I using my assets the correct way? Compliance tracking, I'm sure many of you were involved in the whole ELD transition a few years ago and the hurdles and the challenges and everything with that. So a big part of that is uh, compliance tracking. And then we have video capture. So again, that's the, new, that's the cameras, they've been around a long time. AI cameras are a little newer, but what do we, what are we capturing there? How do those work? So the next question that comes up then is why do I need telematics? I mean, there's, there's, there's a lot of items, right? There's safety, there's driver behavior, there's capturing incident details, improved efficiency, making sure you're using your fleet correctly, fleet planning, do I have enough vehicles? How many are being used every day? What percentage, what size of vehicles do I need? Which types of vehicles do I need? Um, ca capturing all those meters, those measures from the vehicles, again, for all of that predictive maintenance type information. And I mean, the list goes on. I'm sure that all of you would have your own KPIs, what you're interested in, what your organization's interested in. And if you talk to different departments in your organization, they would come up with their own list like this as well. So let's start with, can telematics meet my individual department user needs? So. The first thing that I always look at here is having a customizable, intuitive UI is the key. People need to be able to sit down and use this software. I mean, a lot of you have large organizations that would take a lot of training and then there's specific training for individual user groups, things like that. 
there's just not time to provide all that training to each individual user. So this has to be something they can jump into, play around a little bit and start using. So the example that you're seeing here is the ability to customize tables. So throughout our entire application, a user can come in, set up the tables the way they want, which columns they want, um, the order of the columns they want, how they want them sorted. And then every time they log into the system, that's available to them. So then if they go ever went to export this table, maybe they use it to import into another tool that they have. They just want to analyze, do some additional analysis in Excel. It's in the specific format they need for their job. So customization like that is, is, is really key to people wanting to use the system and, and being able to use it quite easily. Next would be filtering down the data. Now I know that we all, anyone who's deployed telematics here had that honeymoon phase where they wanted to see all thousand vehicles they have in their fleet on the map at one time and all the little ants moving around and it looks really cool. But when you actually get down to the day-to-day -day use of it, people aren't interested in all the vehicles like that in most cases, they're interested in a small subset. So we have filters that could break it down by division, department, user group, things like that. We can break it down by the type of asset. So if you're, let's say a maintenance technician and you're only responsible for heavy duty vehicles, you could just show all the heavy duty vehicles on the map so you know where they're at or where they're parked when it comes time to do maintenance. Next, we have landmarks or geofences. Maybe it's that same technician. I only wanna see all the heavy duty vehicles that are currently parked in my yard because I know they're available. After that, we have groups. You can have public groups and private groups. So public groups are something the administrator can set up. Like I know in our city, we have a Northwest quadrant, Northeast quadrant. Maybe I can easily filter down and just see the vehicles assigned to those different quadrants. But on my personal group, I might be responsible for a subset of vehicles and a subset of employees. So whenever I would always see those vehicles on the map, and then I would also see any vehicle that the employees I'm responsible for hopped into and signed on to on the map. So that would be my customized view. This is just the people and the equipment that I'm responsible for. And then the last section is things like status filters. Like right there, that's an asset trouble light. So maybe that same mechanic is only gonna wanna see vehicles that are heavy duty, that are currently parked in the yard and currently have a trouble light on the dash or DTCs being sent in so that they know that's a real quick and easy way to look at a hit list. There's something wrong with this vehicle and it's available to me. So again, filters and having the, ab the ability to really narrow down exactly what you're looking for is really, really important when you're looking in, into a telematic system. Next is customizable privileges. So what you, what you really wanna be able to do is hide the information that a user doesn't need. So if a user doesn't need to see certain information, certain tabs, certain features, hide those. Don't provide, don't present them. The simpler the interface is for the individual users, again, the more buy-in you're gonna have, the more they're gonna use it, the more they're gonna enjoy it because it's tailored to their needs. Next, and this has come up very often as we've deployed is feature by feature control. So as you can see in the user profile I have there, I have device management turned off because maybe we're only going to give that to a, a service technician type employee. And I have speeding parameters turned off because maybe only my health and safety department want to control those types of parameters. So other users would be able to see what the grace period is over the speed limit, let's say 10%, something like that, that's considered acceptable, but they couldn't set or make any changes because we want that just in the safety department. So having that individual feature by feature control is really, really important. And then again, back to usability in that second image, when you hover over a button that's disabled, if unless a user knows why it's disabled, it seems like it's broken or a bug and people get frustrated really quickly, right? So in our system, if you hover over icons, if you hover over buttons, if they're enabled or disabled, it'll tell you what they'll do, it'll tell you why what you can't do so in this case obviously this user doesn't have authority to view dash cam live stream video i mean a cost comes with that right you're, you're starting to incur more data usage things like that so maybe they don't want to give just anyone access to that type of video and again if that vehicle didn't have it it would let you know that there's no dash cam installed in that vehicle so it has to be really intuitive they shouldn't have to be trained on what that button does when it's disabled they should be able to hover over it and just see that information for themselves Next, we're gonna talk a little bit about why I need AI dash cams in my fleet and 
how to select them, what to look for, how they work. So the first thing is we'll talk about a few of the key benefits of, of dash cams in general. I mean, it leads to safer driving. It can provide evidence if required for driving incidents like accidents and things like that. Um, it's a really good tool for helping fight insurance fraud in that along those same lines. Again, streamlines uh, claim settlements, captures parked incidents. And so even if your vehicle's parked, it detects that there's been a bump, the camera turns on, records it right then to see if someone's walking around, looking to see if they've done damage. With any luck, you'll capture a license plate as they drive by. So it can wake up and it can do those types of things. So a lot of it is about protecting your fleet. And I, I, I think as people are noticing more and more these days, whenever you see something happen online, people stealing Amazon packages, they're caught on video, police events caught on video, accidents caught on video. I think people are starting to realize that there's a lot of video being captured out there. And I don't think you want to be in a situation where one of your employees was in an accident with someone else, the other person does have video of the incident and you don't. Like we're getting to the point where it's more and more likely that someone will have captured that accident with their own, you know, dash cam that they bought for their own personal vehicle, things like that. And again, it's, it's a real advantage to them if they have that and you don't. So the first thing we'll talk about here is a little bit about safe driving. So, I mean, if you look at the very first line, that's basic telematics. And this is, it's a few years dated now, but I'm sure it's probably similar. These are all the driver behaviors causing fatalities. So if you look at the very first line there, 19, a little over 19% were because of speeding. And people always harp on speeding. We know that there's issues with speeding, right? But when we look, start to look down through the list, we actually have a little more than 20% that we could also capture beyond the speeding with the AI dash cams. So are they operating the vehicle in a careless manner? Failure, failure to stay in their lane? Um, are they distracted, talking on the phone, eating, smoking, whatever that might be? Are they drowsy, asleep, ill, things like that? So, I mean, if you have telematics, you're at least going to get speeding. So you're looking at 20% of these causes. But if you had AI dash cams, you're going to double that. So it's a real advantage to have these types of dash cams if you really want to monitor the safety um, of your fleet and the general public for that matter. So a lot of people ask me, well, what if my driver's at fault? I don't wanna have a video showing my driver causing an accident. And when people first asked me that, I thought, yeah, that makes sense. That I can, I, I get that, that makes sense to me too. But then I talked to some few different sources, insurance companies, lawyers, and wanted to know what they thought, right? So if you're at fault, what they work to do is they attempt to settle quickly and keep the payout low to prevent these nuclear verdicts that you hear sometimes in the news and things like that, right? So what they do is they wanna settle quickly, get it finished, get it behind them and move on. Saves you legal fees and even if you're self-insured, different things like that. Overall, there's less cost to you if they know that and they can settle quickly. And then the other case where the other driver's at fault Maybe they push for a larger or more fair settlement, things like that, right? You have that data to back it up and you're able to, to leverage that for, for the purposes that you need. Next is selecting the uh, right dash cam solution. And, and a lot goes into this and I think it's more than, than people typically realize. So the first thing is the system, again, I'm, I'm gonna go back to this many times because you have large organizations with a lot of people to train, it's gotta be easy to use. So that's the first thing I wanna mention there. It should also have a large set of events that it can capture. So we'll, we'll go through a list of those events and I can show you all the different things that we do, but there's probably even more out there. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about AI at the edge and what that means. It's important and I'll, I'll, I'll dedicate a little bit of time about talking to that, but it's something that most people I had never heard of before this, before we started doing this. And I don't think it's something that a lot of people know about. Anytime access is another big feature. I don't wanna to have to wait for someone to go out and turn the uh, camera on or have to pull some kind of memory card out of it. I wanna be able to get video anytime I want. Next is data costs. Data is getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but if you start downloading 4K video and things like that from your vehicles when you don't really need it, it is gonna to start to add up, especially in, in larger fleets. Another consideration is privacy. How much video do you want to capture? Should it be capturing the driver facing or just the forward facing, things like that, and ongoing AI learning. 
So the first thing is easy to use. So in the example here, a user's run a quick history. It just shows the snail trail we're all used to. They click on an event and it pops this up. It shows an image of the video. It shows a little bit of information about the video. They can go ahead and hit, click the play button. It's gonna pull up the video and it's gonna show what's going on there. So I have a cab view, I have a driver view, and I have the forward facing view. It's giving me information at the bottom about the different speeds, directions, things like that. But on the right hand side, you'll see that there's some telematic information there. And having that information right there is more important than a lot of people realize. So let's say that, that my employee was in an accident and they had rear-ended someone. Well, when I look at that video, it would be really important to me to see that video and see maybe there's trouble codes being thrown. Maybe there was an ABS failure and that ABS failure was thrown six hours ago, six days ago, and no one's looked at it. And now we've rear-ended someone and I have an ABS brake failure happening on my vehicle that we never addressed. So again, really important to have a little bit of information here on the right-hand side of that video so that you can see what the vehicle state was at the time that that event was generated. So next we have the list of all the events. So we'll start with the AI events because that's the big buzzword nowadays, right? So there's collision warnings. Now, a lot of your vehicles probably have that today where if you're approaching, let's say, a stopped vehicle too quickly, something like that, it's going to be, it'll it'll give you a collision warning. The dash will be, maybe there'll be some flashing lights. I know it does that on my vehicle. I've had it come up once or twice. Um, next is close following and tailgating. You want to be able to coach and give people information on that. Then there's the accident type information. Was it a heavy hit, a medium hit, a light hit while you were driving? There's lane departure. There's no driver. Now, typically, this is the dash cams obstructed, but maybe you're testing out autopilot on Teslas in your fleet or something like that, and it would show that the vehicle is in motion with no driver. You can also track things like seatbelt with the uh, driver-facing camera. Um, there's distracted, and the basic distracted uses head pose. So if I'm looking out the window, I'm obviously distracted, and it's using my head pose. Now, down the bottom here, I have distracted again, and it's called eye gaze. So this requires another small camera that goes on the, uh, the driver's door A pillar that focuses specifically on the driver's eyes. And that's when you can start to look at things like how long, how long do the blinks take for each blink? How frequently is the driver blinking? Different things like that, where that's where you can really start to see is the driver asleep? Are they drowsy? Are they distracted? So I'm being smart and I'm looking down on my iPhone, but keeping my head looking right out the window, I can definitely start to catch those things. And then you can also catch things like yawning, stop sign violations, where you run a stop sign, things like that. We, they also do the standard events, right? Was there a hit while parked? So was there some kind of hit and run while the vehicle was parked in the lot? Someone backed into it at the mall. What happened? There's a panic button. Something's happened. I've seen something. I'm in trouble. Someone else is in trouble. I'm going to hit that panic button. Someone can be automatically notified. Then there's the hard, hard, harsh, and severe driving. So maybe I only want to track once a month and see how many hard events I've had. Maybe weekly I'll look at the harsh events, but maybe if there's severe driving events, Maybe a supervisor needs to get notified real time and get that text or email on their phone. And then there's tampering. Is someone trying to remove the memory card? Is someone touching the device? I mean, the camera will wake up. I can't get into my vehicle and open the door without the camera waking up and starting recording. So tampering, it's, it, it's, it's really quite easy to catch things like that. Then some of the future events we're looking to add, there's pedestrian collision warnings. So similar to the driving collision warning where you're coming up on a car too quickly, it will detect a pedestrian moving into your driving path and warn you of that. There'll be stoplight violations for yellow or amber and red lights, and then posted speed sign violations. So anyone who's ever done any speed limit tracking, maps can get out of date, speed limits can change on roads. This would actually read the posted speed limit signs and base speeding violations on the signs that it's seeing as the user's driving down the road. So some pretty exciting stuff there. So now I'll talk a little bit about artificial intelligence at the edge. So what some of the initial cameras did, and a lot of them still do today, is they'll detect that there might be something that's gone wrong here, some kind of event. They'll send in a clip of that video to the backend server. All the AI will run on the backend server and then send you back a message saying, yes, this was close following or 
lane departure or smoking or things like that. So there's you incur quite a bit of delay there. Where artificial intelligence at the edge, which is the way we, we have our cameras set up, is it's detecting it right on the camera. So the moment that it detects you're following too closely, you have the ability to coach the driver on that. You have the ability to start generating events. You can do that in real time. So that's a, a big piece to look for when you're talking about selecting the right AI camera for your, uh, for your fleet. Uh, some more things here, anytime access. So a lot of cameras, older ones specifically, you'd have to remove the card. When you wanted to grab some video, you'd plug it in, you'd scroll around, you'd find where the right time was and you download it. Um, other cameras nowadays, they're online. So the camera will wake up every six hours, something like that and see, has anyone requested any video from me and send it in at that point. What we're doing now is we're waking, we, we have the ability to wake that camera up at any time. It's in, a, it's in a low power state, but we can wake that up at any moment to turn on live video. You can turn on, you can look up historical video and it's available real time. So that, that, that's a big, a big piece that I don't think people realize how important it is until they've deployed it and they're sitting around waiting for video because something's happened and, that, and they, they can't get access real time. Next is focusing on keeping your data costs low. So you need full control of when the events are generated. So take close following. Close following is when you're when you're within two seconds of hitting the vehicle in front of you. So you're two seconds behind the video vehicle in front of you, and then tailgating is with you're within one second. Now there's heavily congested cities where that just wouldn't make sense. You would be tailgating and close following all the time. So you need the ability to set that threshold lower. Maybe it's half a second and a second so that you're not getting constant video being downloaded all the time and just blowing your data costs through the roof. So it's really important to have that fine control of when you want those events generated. Next is you need the ability to limit the video length. So what's important? How long do I need the video? If someone runs a stop sign, I probably only need a few seconds before, a few seconds after, I'm going to see the speed they were going. I'm going to see they never stopped and rolled through. That's enough. I don't need 30 seconds before and 30 seconds after. I, I could download that after the fact if I want to. But just for that event, maybe that's all I need. Next is have the ability to only send video when you need it. So when you saw the little picture of our, of our video player there before I actually hit play, it had an image. So for something like seatbelt, I probably don't need a video showing someone not wearing a seatbelt. Just that image is enough. And I can download that image and use that to show them, hey, look, you weren't wearing a seatbelt here. And then the last is um, coaching to prevent events. Now, this is a big one. Don't just track and let your driver know you've broken the rules. We've sent this in. It's a mark on your scorecard. Because then you need video for every one of those. Instead, and this, this requires the AI at the edge, coach them. Give them that upfront notice that, hey, you're following too close, take some action, or this is going to generate an event and show up on your, uh, on your driver scorecard. You also need the ability to control driver distraction. I know that in a lot of different states and provinces, there's different rules. So maybe coaching the driver with an audible um, increased following distance would be considered a distraction. So you have to have the ability to turn that on and off. You can't have it so that that's always on because if that becomes a... Uh, if that's not allowed, because that's considered as a distraction, that would be on, on you or, or your company, right? And then the privacy options. Maybe here we're, we should only be looking at forward facing. Maybe that's all I'm allowed. Maybe I have a contract with my drivers and, and I'm not allowed to have driver facing. Great, I wanna be able to just turn on forward facing. Or maybe I wanna generate events without video. So maybe I want the driver facing camera to be turned on and I want it to generate an event when someone's smoking but that's never stored to the card. None of that video is ever stored to the card. It's just analyzed, events generated, so I can get those events, someone's smoking, someone's on the cell phone, someone's yawning a whole bunch, right? They're, they must be tired without actually recording them. And then last is a driver-only cabin, cabin video. In that small video clip you guys saw, I had the whole cab there. Maybe sometimes that's important, right? An Uber driver, someone like that, they would probably wanna have the whole cab on the video. But in other times, Maybe you just want to have your driver and not record the passengers. So that's, that's an option as well. And then ongoing AI, AI learning. You need the ability to say, this event was generated. I considered a false alarm, and here's why. Send that in, 
and know that that's going to go back to the AI engine and it's going to learn about that. So one example I had when I was first playing with this is I would drive by a school bus and as you can see right here, there's a stop sign. So it would tell me I ran a stop sign. Now I went past the stop sign and I didn't stop, but this isn't the stop sign we're looking for, right? So I mean, the AI could start to learn, hey, if there's a stop sign and a big yellow background, maybe maybe we don't generate that event. So that ongoing AI learning where you can contribute and everyone using the system can contribute to making the system better is really important to uh, for an improved experience over time. Next, let's talk about can telematics make adding EVs to my fleet easier? I mean, that's that's another big ticket these days, right? Everyone wants to add EVs. It's a PR thing, it's a marketing thing. We wanna have EVs, we wanna go green. So how does this work? So the first thing we wanna talk about, I mean, there's the cost, but usually the cost is offset by the public perception and things like that, that a company's trying to do better. But let's talk about some of the roadblocks, the actual technical road, roadblocks that people have. So the first one is range anxiety. I can't take a jerry can out to a uh, to an EV when it runs out of out of fuel. I need to go out there and I need to tow it. So there's that whole range anxiety piece. Next is the charging infrastructure deployment. Do I need to set up chargers in my yard? How much is this going to cost? Do I have the right power? Things like that. So a lot to think about there. So what EV what telematics brings to the table when trying to choose EVs or things like this? run easy reports and show this is over 90 days, what's the average number of miles my vehicle drives a day, and what's the maximum they've driven in the last 90 days. So I can look here, and there's probably EVs out there that could replace all of the vehicles I have right here on this list. So you'd wanna be able to look at this at different time ranges, things like that as part of these reports. You'd wanna look at monthly reports, quarterly, yearly, seasonal maybe, big temperature swings. The next is tracking idling. So this was my truck. I looked at it over the last um, 90 days as well. And I had 10 idling events for a total of one hour and 26 minutes. Now, in the span of three months, that's not a big deal. It's not going to it's not going to impact anything. But you might have drivers that spend a lot of time in their vehicle in cold environments and hot environments. They need to have the heater or the AC on to keep them comfortable. So that can also affect your battery life and, and your uh, your range. Then the last one is the ambient temperature. Again, in those really cold or really hot regions, it's either trying to cool, your vehicle's trying to cool the battery or it's trying to warm the battery. And again, that takes power. So you can get all this type of information from your telematics devices to make informed decisions on what percentage of your fleet vehicles you think you can replace with EVs. Um, Next, next, we'll talk a little bit about deploying with minimal, minimal charging infrastructure. So let's talk about that whole infrastructure piece. Now, there's ways with telematics you can avoid um, implementing charging infrastructure altogether. And this is through take-home charging. So in this case, it looks like here, someone lives in an apartment complex and maybe they have some EV chargers, so they're charging that there. This person is set up to charge their vehicle at home. They take their vehicle home every day and they charge it there. So what you can do with telematics is you can say, okay, almost like we've done with fuel for many, many years, you'll give so many 50, 60 cents per gallon, something like that, or 50, sorry, 50, 60 cents per mile, something like that to reimburse people if they're using their own vehicle, this would be very similar. We can track that a charging event happened at this person's home and we can tell that 20 kilowatt hours was put into that battery and you can come up with rates that automatically show up in reports that are sent to your payroll system so you know how to reimburse those people that are taking those EVs home with them. And then beyond that, if that's still not an option, at least look for um, a telematics provider that has integrated charging partners so that you can pull information in. How much is this costing us? How much are we charging? What should I be billed? Who's using this more? Who's using this less? Things like that. And I mean, in an ideal world, your telematic provider would have their own in-house charging uh, hardware. So the advantages of that, you're always gonna have a better integration. You're gonna get more information and it's just gonna flow a lot smoother into your overall fleet management system when you choose a telematics provider that has their own, their own charging um, hardware. So how can I get my drivers to buy into collecting this telematic data? So I always thought, great, we're, we, we had lots of fights, big brother, drivers don't want 
people to know where they are. So that was our original big fight back in the day, right? I thought, eventually they're gonna be used to it, this is gonna go away. Then we had harsh driving. Oh, well, drivers don't like harsh driving. So as we've added more and more telematics parameters, there's always been some kind of pushback, the next pushback. So I think we're over GPS. Any vehicle you buy now pretty much has GPS, whether people realize it or not. Um, their phones are tracked by GPS. I mean, I think people have gotten over the whole, where am I? That's that's a thing in the past. We don't get pushed back on that much anymore. But now we're talking about the AI cameras and driver facing cameras. So what do we have to consider here? So the first thing you'd wanna do before putting in any system like this, review your driver or union contracts. Maybe you have subcontractors doing the driving for you or, or unionized drivers, things like that. Make sure that what you're, whatever you're looking to implement doesn't violate any of those contracts. So that's a big one, that's number one. Next, and I, I don't think people do this enough, is communicate the details of this new system with your drivers. Have meetings, have Q&A sessions. Um, a big part of this that I was involved in a number of times was EV, because drivers had a lot of concerns. Um, in some cases, drivers, all of their overtime would now be cut off because the EV tracked things a little bit closer and they used to make time and a half. So this was impacting their income and everything else. So have these discussions ahead of time. It's a lot easier to have them ahead of time than have people worried about it. They're making incorrect assumptions, things like that, when it actually comes time to deploy. And you don't have to do this on your own. Like I said, I've been involved in many meetings with different unions or groups or things like that because I've heard a lot of those questions. I'm not hearing them for the first time with you and you're standing at the front of the room with your group. I, I can answer some of those questions. I know the technical details. So getting your telematic provider involved in those kind of discussions, I think is a really good idea if it's at all possible for you. And in those meetings, continually focus, focus on the positives, right? Safety. Um, exonerating them from false claims with the uh, with the dash cams, improving efficiency. And then with the system, use it also to reward your drivers. So it's not just the stick, it's a bit of a carrot as well, right? And reminding everyone that safety is a mutual goal. You put in these kind of systems and it can reduce incidents by up to 60%, which turns into an 86% in cost reduction for those types of in incidents. I mean, these, those are big numbers that people would start to understand, hey, we can be more efficient. Maybe we can afford to pay drivers a little bit more. Maybe we can, you know what I mean, add more drivers to the fleet so there's not as much work for everyone. There's advantages that can be gained even at the driver level. So having these discussions up front are really important. Next, avoid singling out individual drivers. Now, when people first get these systems, I always see it. Oh, look, this person was speeding. I'm gonna go tell them they were speeding at this intersection, at this time, on this day, and that I know about it. Now, yeah, you, you can do that. But then the whole big brother thing comes in, people get paranoid, everything else. A lot nicer way to do this is something like this where you, you have a heat map of all the driving incidents. So maybe I'm the safety trainer, I'm sitting down with one of the groups and I say, okay, listen, everybody, Here's what we've been doing over the last month. Here's where we're having trouble speeding. So the 301 is probably the area where we can really focus and try to reduce our speeding on the 301. And let's review this again during our next safety meeting and see if we've improved. Now, you haven't pointed out any individual drivers. You're addressing it as let's work on this as a team. I mean, the individual drivers that know they speed here that are sitting in that room know it's them. But at least this way, it's it's a bit of a soft start. People know it's being tracked. At that point, they realize that they could know which vehicle it was if, if you wanted to, but you're not pointing that out. You're not calling out individual drivers. It's not the big brother. Let's work as a team. I think this is a really good approach when starting. Uh, next, we talked a little bit about this already, coaching. I don't want devices and telematics and cameras that just tell me once, hey, I, I just put a mark on your scorecard because you were following too close. I mean, if there's nothing I can do about it and it's already happened, that just makes me feel bad. I get annoyed. I don't like the system. Now, if it coaches me with, again, this is a good example of that AI at the edge that would be required for this, increase following distance. It's detected that I'm following too close. And now it's going to give me some time to back off a little bit so that doesn't appear on my scorecard. So all of a sudden, this little device instead of just being a tattletale, almost becomes a little bit of a tool where they can avoid getting those marks on their, uh, on their scorecard, which again, they'll really appreciate. 
And then what do I do with all this data? Again, there is so much data that we can collect nowadays. And I'm sure that a lot of people on this call right now have written RFPs that want the moon, the sun, the stars, everything in between, more data than they could use ever in case one day they need it. I mean, we see this in RFPs all the time. So the biggest thing I can say here is capture and store the data that you need. The first thing you should be doing is looking at what key performance indicators you have for your organization and capturing the data you need to, to make changes within your organization to improve those metrics. So turn off events that you don't plan on tracking. If, if I'm in a company and I know that there's, that there's a lot of idling going on because we have PTOs, it's a boom truck, we deliver drywall, whatever it happens to me, whatever, whatever it happens to be, don't track idling. Why do people need idling events cluttering up their asset history little map there if, they're, if idling is considered okay in your system? Don't track it. Less is more when it comes to what people see. We talked about this too. Don't download video when an image or an event will do. Why do you want to have endless videos that you are not staffed to look at when someone can quickly look at an image if they needed to, or maybe they just get a total of all the events where people have been smoking? I don't need to download a video of someone smoking. A picture is probably enough. But even at that state, maybe I just see which drivers are smoking in the cab. I'll, I'll review this for a month and I'll say, okay, there's these three drivers smoking in the cab. I'm only going to track their vehicles and download the picture every time there's a smoking event. So just configure it to do that. It's going to save you data plan. It's going to save someone having to look through this stuff. And again, it just makes it that much easier for your users. And then set reporting rates for all your GPS and different things like that by asset type. There's assets that never move. I've seen people that had, had required one second reporting for a light generator, you know, those big lights, the poles that for work sites and things like that, that probably moved once a month. And they wanted second by second data of that thing parked 99% of the time that would just run huge histories, it would show the same address over, that's not required. If it starts to move, sure, ramp up the reporting rate. Maybe once every 15 minutes report that, yeah, it's still sitting there, we know exactly where it is. When it's moving, great. Make those decisions based on the asset type because it just makes a lot more sense because a lot of things typically don't move. There's a lot that won't move. And then store high resolution data when you need it. So you, you can get many reports per second with a lot of these devices, right? But many reports per second, does that make any sense for what people are actually going to use other than maybe an accident recreation or some type of event like that? So don't, don't download, store data, turn everything on because you can. Look at your individual organization and take the data and download and store the data you need. It's going to be easier for people to go through easier for them to digest, things won't be as cluttered, and you're still gonna get all the information you need for your fleet. And again, I have to keep bringing this up because I think it's really, really important to get buy-in from all the users that you have in your diverse organizations. Ensure they can easily filter down to what, what's interesting to them and set up the system so you can hide or remove anything that they don't need. The more simple this telematic system is for them, the better. They're not going to be impressed that it does a thousand things when they need five. If you can just show them the five things they need to do their job, that's when they're going to love this and they're going to want to use this system every day and not hunting through those thousand things that it's capable of. So that's really, really important. Then the last piece is, is reports. I think this is, this is a place where a lot of people have gaps. In, uh, in, in how they use reports, what they're using reports for, when they should have reports. So again, at the start of the project, identify all those key performance indicators you plan on tracking, and then work with the telematics provider to see, do you have these reports, or if not, can we customize them? Every telematics provider is going to have a big baseline of reports that they've either created for other people or thought about themselves over time, and they may or may not meet all of your needs. And if you have 500 reports to look through and you're looking for a specific utilization report, you may never find it. So make sure that you work with your telematics provider to address specifically what you need and find out which reports you should be using. And if they don't exist, let's get those built up for you, right? 
Next is schedule reports. No one wants to go in and manually run reports every day, every week. It's just not necessary, right? Let's schedule those reports. Let's get them in their inbox at the end or start of every week, whatever they need, so that it's easy for them and it's right there. And then the last part is report training. Again, if you just present this to users and say, look, we have 500 reports, you'll have everything you ever need in there, go, they're likely not gonna find it. Let's talk to the individual departments. Let's say, what kind of reports do you need? Okay, you need these three reports? Here, are the th here they are, here's the list of the reports you need. Don't worry about any of these other ones. Let's schedule these, they'll come to you, and that's it for your reporting. You don't need this other stuff. You don't need to look through these 500. I'm glad there's 500. You need these three. So that's another uh, a big thing that I think a lot of sites miss when they're initially deploying is really drilling down and making sure that people know which reports to use, do the right reports exist, let's get those scheduled, and then train them on what those reports are and what information it's providing them. So that's the last item I wanted to talk about today. Um, I guess we'll we'll open it up for questions at this point. Yep, uh, thank you, Phil. So we do have some time remaining and we have had a few questions coming in. Um, we'll start with the first one and first one's pretty simple. Do you track fuel use? Yes, so with, our, with the same telematics device you deploy for everything I've showed you today, you can track fuel use. So you can track either fuel for regular gas powered, gas diesel powered vehicles, or you can track fuel for electric vehicles. I kind of showed you that example of electric vehicles where you can track, are they charging at home? How much they're charging, things like that. And we have our own charging hardware that you can install either in your yard, people's homes, where, wherever it makes sense for you. But we also have fuel systems that can be used to track fuel used at your facilities if you dispense your own fuel. So if you wanna make sure that diesel never goes into a gas vehicle or vice versa, if you wanna make sure that only vehicles that should be fueling at that location are there, that telematics device that you've installed to get all the rest of this data can also manage all of that for you without installing any additional devices in your vehicle. Got it. And the next question is, how much video is stored on the camera system? So it's configurable. Um, to give you an idea, with the, with the largest card that the, uh, the camera can support, we can get 83 days of video, assuming that it's recording and the vehicle's being used for eight hours a day. So in a lot of our fleets, the vehicles are never used eight hours a day. That's someone who's doing deliveries or something like that. Those are special use cases. But in a lot of these cases, it's gonna be used much less than that. In addition, so you would have more than 83 days, I guess is what I'm getting at. If you only used your vehicles four hours a day, you'd be getting 160 days, right? So the other thing we do is we store events in a separate area. Now, if an event's generated, that's stored in an area where it actually gets even more time than that. So those are the specific events. So even if I wasn't sending in my video for smoking, I could go back maybe 50 days later and still pull that smoking event if I had to show the driver, show their supervisor, something like that. The other thing we do, I guess, as far as storing video is, when we capture video and it's stored and available to you on the website, all of that video is available there for a year. Now, after a year, we put it into what we call cold storage, but it's still available. You'd have to request it. So maybe there was an accident, it happened a year and a half ago, no one reported it until now, and you have to go back and get it. We have that video. It's just a request into us to pull that up for you. It's not gone. And we store that video indefinitely. Well, and another question goes off what you're saying. Will the camera be in on all the time during the vehicle battery? Yeah, so in all honesty, I mean, that's being in this industry as long as I have, that's always been a problem, right? Draining batteries. And I was worried about it too. So I'm, I'm up in Canada. We get down to minus 40. And sometimes at that point, working from home now, I just don't want to go out in minus 40. So a week might go by and I'm, I'm not at home. So the camera actually is turned off. The cell modem inside goes into a very low, low, low power state where it can just receive a message, a text message, wake up the modem, then it'll wake up the camera and it'll start reporting. So in all my experience, I never had any issues. I mean, I had, I had it all last winter. My battery's four years old in my truck. And I never had any problems, even in those really hard cold snaps that I could tell that it drained my battery at all. 
Another audience member wanted to know, is AssetWorks using a telematics platform by Samsara, GPS Insight, Verizon, or does AssetWorks have their own platform with Google Maps? So what the images that you saw today, um, the little videos, things like that, those are all those were all of our our actual in-house telematics platform. So we do partner with some of the uh, the different providers that you mentioned, but everything I talked about today, all the different functionality and everything else, is available within our own in-house platform, which does end up having the tightest integration compared to some of the third parties, right? Have you seen instances where the existing dash cams and law enforcement vehicles are tied into a telematic system? I haven't seen that, to be honest. Um, we're looking at doing different things for law enforcement as well as far as telematics go is, can we build our telematics device with our partners to not have a GPS receiver? So maybe we're still getting all the maintenance information, maybe we're getting the meters, maybe we're getting, you know what I mean, all of that engine data that someone on the maintenance side would be interested in, but they don't want the location available with that. So we would actually build the hardware without it. So I don't know if that's tied in specifically to the dash cams, but what we're looking at doing for law enforcement is giving that ability to track all that maintenance information, pull it into your telematics system, but not have the locations that might get into the wrong hands. Someone else wanted to know, is it a separate site or can I access this data in the M5 software? So a lot of this data, everything maintenance related flows automatically through into the M5 software. So it's also available in, in the website that you saw, the telematics site, which maybe other user groups, things like that will use. But as far as technicians are concerned, all of the trouble lights, the meters, everything else will fuel use will automatically flow through into, into your M5 or fleet focus system. How does AssetWorks use the telematics information to help with maintenance? So what we're doing, what we're doing currently today is you're going to get all your odometer and engine hour readings. So this was typically a manual process and people would struggle with it. Drivers wouldn't write it down, things like that. And maintenance would be missed. It would affect warranties, things like that. So then the next step is let's get all of this from the vehicle. Now, what we ran into there is the vehicle's not always right. The engine, it doesn't always match what's showing on the dash. So we put a lot of time this year into making sure that we are always going to display what is on the vehicle's dash so it matches up with your maintenance system. The next piece with that is we're going to pass all of the diagnostic trouble codes, the engine lights, and that also into your maintenance system. What happens then, you can either choose to automatically generate work orders for those items, or it can just show up in a report. And what we're looking to do further on in 2023 and into 2024 is predictive maintenance. So based on the number of trouble codes that have come in, various combinations, how often, the frequency, we're gonna to start to predict based on the driving habits of the driver, based on what trouble codes are coming in, your brakes are gonna to need to be replaced in the next two months. Your tires are probably gonna be worn. You're, you're gonna have an engine failure of this type within the next three months, unless you take some proactive action. So there's a lot we're doing there to alleviate the need for people to look at those trouble codes and figure out what should I do? When should I do it? How, how does this affect me? To actually predicting what the outcome will be if those types of things aren't addressed. And we want to get some clarification. Is footage from AI dash cameras accessible through the AssetWorks platform? And they also wanted to know what brand of dash cams are these? Yeah, so the, the, the dash cam data is available in our platform. So what you were seeing there, you were the, the pictures and things that I showed on the uh, on, on in the webinar here, those are pictures of the Asworks GPS application, again, tied through all into Fleet Focus. And that was the video being played right in the application. That's another thing, another good ease of use question that I like is those cameras. I mean, that data, people don't like to have to go into another website, log in somewhere else, remember another password. They don't want to have to go and dig up that information. They can get that information right there for them in the application. They don't have to go anywhere and it's available. And, and these are these are our asset works. We've partnered with, with a, uh, a, an AI dash cam partner, but we're specifically doing a lot of this stuff with them directly for AssetWorks GPS. Another question, are your telematics devices and dash cameras proprietary hardware or white labeled from some supplier partner? 
Um, we don't we don't build any of the hardware, but we work directly with the partners. Um, what we try to do too with telematics devices, an example, is we've been we've been working with a partner located in the U.S. So not only do they design the hardware in you in the U.S., I've been down to their facility talking to them. They actually manufacture all the products in the U.S. So we really look for local local designers that, that are designing these products, as well as support teams, as well as the manufacturing whenever it's possible, so that we can really get that that relationship built up. And again, I, the good example of that was the uh, for the police. Let's build this device without GPS so we can just track all that maintenance data and have that flow back. Then we don't have all those complaints. Well, this maintenance data, a mechanic could sell that. It could get into the wrong hands, the locations, you know what I mean? Different things like that. We can work with those providers with a really tight relationship that are, for all intents and purposes, local, right? I mean, how many how many of us have any electronics anywhere that are designed, built, manufactured, and supported in the U.S., right? I mean, I, I don't think I can think of any, to be honest, but that, that that's the type of relationships we look for with the third parties. We have time for one more question, um, and this question is, does AssetWorks maintenance software integrate with the Samsara camera? We do have partnerships with Samsara. Um, we do pull in um, things like meters and things like that. I, I, again, the advantage of our own platform, I guess, the only differentiator would be the tighter integration where we might be pushing um, when's maintenance due back into our telematics platform or with motor pool when vehicles are assigned out, we'd want to be able to um, assign those those drivers so it would show up in the telematics portal. So there'll be a lot of, of a tighter integration, but yeah, definitely we do have we do have a relationship with Sensor. Well, thank you, Phil. That is all the time that we have for today. Um, but for anyone who asked a question that wasn't answered, again, we will be following up uh, via email to answer your questions individually. And uh, we hope that you all enjoyed today's webinar. I want to thank you again, Phil, and AssetWorks for today's presentation. I also want to mention that this webinar will be available on demand on the Government Fleet website at governmentfleet.com forward slash webinars. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everybody.